to be looking at the liver. The liver is the only organ in the body that has the ability to regrow. It's the only recoverable organ, and your liver lives under your right rib. And it is the largest internal organ in the body. And the liver, we call it the project manager, because everything that comes into the body goes first to the liver, and everything that comes out of the body comes out under the jurisdiction of the liver. So I'd like to have a look at, first of all, what does it do with what grows into the body? And never in the history of mankind have human beings eaten so many carbohydrates. And I don't think anyone chose to eat this way. I think it's just something that evolved. It's just something that happened because people today are so busy and they're just quick. So the quickest breakfast in the whole wide world is cereal. And I had a part of my breakfast was quick. It was called apple. You don't have to do anything to an apple meal. But I think what frustrates people, it takes a while to eat it. <laughs> Whereas the cereal, you hardly have to chew. And there is a, a Scottish dentist and he's quoted in the book Breath by James Ness, the interesting book, how people don't chew enough today and they should be chewing crunchy, crunchy foods. That's why I say, if you've got a two-year-old, don't peel the apple, just give them the apple. I can tell you, they'll work it out. <laughs> it's good for their teeth. So cereal bread is another very quick, fast food and because neither of these foods take pe people very long, they can't go very far on them, then cakes, we'll just say cakes, etc. So when I say cakes, etc., this takes into consideration muffins and croissants and pasties and pretzels and cookies and biscuits, all of that. And another quick carbohydrate is pasta. And, and pizza, the Europeans have introduced us to pizza and pasta. People think Italians eat pizza and pasta all the time, but traditionally they were just for special occasions. In fact, the majority of the time it was thick minestrone soups. That's what most people ate. But the pizza and the pasta, they take a little bit of time, so they were more for special occasions. Rice is also a carbohydrate food. Potato is a carbohydrate food. And last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallized acid extracted from the sugarcane plant. All of these foods break down in the gastrointestinal tract to a singular structure called glucose. And glucose gets taken into the blood you see, our gastrointestinal tract is a hollow tube, but anything that goes into that hollow tube is not part of you or me till it gets into the blood. And in Leviticus 17.11, the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. You see, the blood carries the oxygen. It carries the nutrients. It carries the water to the CBD. Let's go to the CBD, which is the inside workings of the cell. So here's the CBD. The glucose goes in. It goes through a 20-step pathway, and this 20-step pathway delivers to us two units of energy. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate, and pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into the powerhouse. This next section is called the powerhouse because even though it's only a eight-step pathway, it delivers 36 units of energy. And what makes the difference is oxygen. This eight-step pathway uses oxygen to produce energy. This 20-step pathway, no oxygen. And we'll be looking at those pathways a little bit more as we go through this week in relation to different conditions in the body. So the first place that the liver sends the glucose is to the cell. But there's still a lot of glucose left over. Only so much can go through the energy pathway. So now it gets stored like a little bunch of grapes 
And this little bunch of grapes, they're little molecules of glucose, and they're called glycogen. Glycogen is a name given to quick-release glucose stores. And the third place, because on a high-carbohydrate diet, we've still got glucose left over, the third place that is sent is in the most amazing fuel depot in the human body, fuel storage, it's called fat cells. So the third place that it gets sent is as fat. Now I've just given you the basic science there, and as you can see by what I've shown you, fat doesn't make you fat. What makes you fat? <laughs> it's the high carbohydrate foods that make you fat. And there's a very famous doctor named Dr. Robert Atkins. He made this famous. <laughs> and he knew his science. He knew that the high carbohydrate is what causes the fat. So he went on an experiment where he stopped all carbohydrates. And we know, we know the results. In fact, his book was number one on the New York Times best-selling book list four years running. People loved him. Nutritionists hated him. Doctors hated him. But that's basically was his theory, and it was a correct theory. So you can do this similar Atkins on a plant-based diet. So on a plant-based diet, we're having the uh, the low carb, more low carbohydrate, which is nuts and seeds and legumes. And as you see by what I showed you in the last class, we don't have to worry about legumes, le lectins in the legumes, as long as they're well prepared, as long as they're well prepared. And so that's what the liver does with the glucose that comes into our body. What about the what about the environmental poisons that we are all exposed to every day? Hopefully not every day, but at different times through our life, it's almost inevitable. I think I might have got a little bit on my plane flight yesterday. But we live in an incredible body with an inbuilt ability to heal and even detox if it's given the right conditions. So when an environmental poison comes into the body, it always goes straight to the liver because the liver is the project manager. And the liver will look at it and it might say, oh, this is a nasty guy, wrap him up in fat and store him. And that's why we had a Vietnam veteran do our program and he said to me, my doctor says to me, don't lose weight. Why did his doctor say that? because his doctor knew that in his fat cells there's some pretty nasty stuff, but, you know, because the Vietnam War was one was the first major war where chemical warfare was used. And those Vietnam veterans, you know, they're sick. And, you know, very sad that a lot of the children there, they're giving, you know, uh, siring, giving birth, they've they got problems too because of the chemicals. So when he came to our program, we were, cauf we were cautious. And I'll show you as we go through this exactly what we did. So at our health retreat, at 8 o'clock every morning, we give a juice. And at 10 o'clock, and at 12 o'clock, and at 2 o'clock, and at 4 o'clock. So the juice that we predominantly give is 80% carrot juice and 10% apple juice, and 10% celery. This is called the vegetarian milk because you can just about subsist on this. And I have met two mothers that gave their baby this instead of milk because the babies could not handle any type of milk. So the carrot, celery, and apple juice. Now, even though we give five juices in a day, that's predominantly the juice that we use. Sometimes we'll add beets, sometimes we'll add some ginger, sometimes we'll do a bit less carrot and put uh, some cucumber in to make it. Sometimes we'll put greens in, so it's a variation on the theme. And there are five juices that we give a day. On Monday and on Tuesday, we do slightly different things. And as I go through the three stage of the liver detox, this will make sense to you. So on Monday, 
At the eight o'clock juice, we serve green barley. And on Monday at the 12 o'clock juice, we give a green barley supplement and also at the four o'clock juice. So the, the juice that we give is eight ounces. And the green barley su supplement we give is about one ounce. I'm just guessing it might be one or two ounces. That's just a little. Green barley. Green barley. Oh, you can okay. buy green barley powder. Mm -hmm. So it should be a teaspoon of that, and we put some uh, bit of lemon and water in it. And at 10 o'clock, we give a protein drink. I call it PP, the protein powder. And as we go through the three phases of the liver detox, you'll understand why that is so. Now, there's a change on Tuesday because our guests do two, two days on juices. On Tuesday at 8 o'clock, we give the protein. On Tuesday at 10 o'clock, we do the green barley. So on Tuesday, we do three proteins and two green barleys, whereas on Monday, we do three green barleys and two proteins. And there's a reason for that, as you'll see, as we go through the three stage of the liver detox. What's the protein we give? And... The protein is probably about two ounces. We usually use a pea protein. You can get a lot of different types of protein powders now. You can get a hemp protein powder. You can get um, a pea protein powder made out of legumes. You can get brown rice. You can get organic soy. So it's important to make sure there's no sugar in it. So when we mix our protein drink together, it's usually a teaspoon of the protein um, and a little bit of almond or organic soy milk and a little bit of coconut milk. And that's actually quite nice, that little mix. So let's begin by showing you what happens and why we do all that. So the liver it's got to get rid of the fat-soluble toxin. You see, the fat-soluble toxins are coming into our bodies in numerous ways. And most, most toxins are in a fat-soluble form. And our body cannot get rid of the fat-soluble toxin. It has to be broken down to a water-soluble. And that's what the three phase of the liver detox does. It breaks it down into a water-soluble state. And it does it through three phases. So phase one of the liver detox happens with our guests. So our guests come in on Sunday. They have a beautiful lunch. We find that that gets them through the two fasting days, the thought. <laughs> It shows them if we fed them well on Sunday lunch, we'll feed them well again. We tell them we're going to feed them very well Monday, Tuesday, but it's all going to be liquid. And so Sunday lunch, and they don't eat again till Wednesday morning breakfast. So what we do at 6 o'clock, or I think it's actually 6.30, every, every afternoon we serve broth. And broth is a lot of vegetables cooked in a lot of water for about five hours and then strained. And then we put Celtic salt in. So that's their evening. And they can have one cup or two cups or three cups, whatever they like. That's broth. So that's the 6.30 one. So on Sunday they have a nice lunch and then they have broth at night. And so Monday morning... At 8 o'clock, the first juice is served, and it's served with green barley. Monday morning, the body begins to go through its three phase of liver detox. And phase one, the liver takes the fat-soluble toxin, and it breaks it down to a metabolite. What's a metabolite? Metabolite just really means the first stage of metabolism or the first stage of breakdown. But this metabolite is highly volatile. 
This metabolite, it creates, it creates a lot of free radicals and free radicals can damage the tissues because free radicals are basically an atom with an electron short. So your, your free radicals are also something that's created with this metabolite. The metabolite also often creates something a hundred times more toxic than it originally was. So it appears that in phase one of the liver detox, something's been created that's worse than it originally was. So the best way to explain this is what happens when you clean out the garden shed. It's often a hundred times worse halfway through than when you started. It's like what happens when you're uh, making a meal. Sometimes the kitchen can look like a bomb hit it halfway through. It's like what happens when you're cleaning out the kitchen cupboards. The kitchen can look a hundred times messier than when you started. It's a process. And the liver has certain needs as it goes through phase one. So the needs of phase one, the needs in phase one are antioxidants. So antioxidants basically come along with a lot of extra electrons. Now remember I said that the free radical are atoms that are an electron short. And so they've got to grab an electron from the next atom to stabilize them. And then that electron grabs from another one. So it's this cascade of damaging effect through the body. And a lot of uh, environmental poisons can cause that. But in phase one of the liver detox, as the liver breaks this fat soluble toxin down to a metabolite, it creates sorry, it creates these free radicals. And so what the liver needs at this stage is antioxidants. So the most potent antioxidants are beta-carotene. And beta-carotene is found in all your orange and your red and your green colored vegetables. So you'll see by the juices I described here that every juice is either orange or red or green. So we supply high antioxidants. And the green barley, it's very green. Green barley powder mixed with a little water and lemon juice, it's very green. So that's another way that we're supplying antioxidants to help with phase one of the liver detox. Also, another antioxidant is vitamin C. And vitamin C is not a scorpic acid. Have you ever got an envelope in the mail and there's nothing in the envelope? It's very disappointing. In fact, it's fruitless. That's ascorbic acid. It's like an envelope with nothing in it. But in plants, you'll find ascorbic acid with bioflavonoids. So when you buy vitamin C, it must be with ascorbic acid, yes, but with bioflavonoids. So that's an antioxidant. That's probably the most famous antioxidant. With what? Pardon? With what? Bioflavonoids. Are you familiar with Andrew Saul and his work on vitamin C? No. Because he talks about mega dosing vitamin C, which we've used with great success, but no buying five months because you, you, you could take 40, 60,000 milligrams, you know, just straight out over the day. Okay, so that's that's another another issue. Yeah. Well, Linnaeus Pauling, you know, and his work on vitamin C, it was always the whole C. So the whole C, but ascorbic acid with bioflavonoids. The other antioxidant is is vitamin E. Now, vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin, so we're supplying vitamin E in the protein drinks. So in the protein drinks, we've got some uh, coconut milk and we've got almond milk, so there's you've got some vitamin E there. So we say to our guests, we're nutritionally supporting your liver to effectively detoxify you. Within 36 hours of starting a detoxogram, so this is 36 hours now, so for our guests that have come in, remember they came in on Sunday, they had a good lunch, their last meal was Sunday lunch. So by the time they wake up Tuesday morning, they're well in to phase two of the liver detox. So phase two of the liver detox 
we go into a different stage. So phase two, the liver takes this highly toxic metabolite, this highly volatile uh, free radical creating metabolite, and it joins it together with amino acids. So in phase two, 36 hours after starting a detox, the liver in phase two takes this toxic metabolite, joins it together with amino acids. Now the union of the amino acid and the toxic metabolite, that creates the water-soluble state. <laughs> And as a water-soluble state, it can be easily released out of the body. And phase three, phase three happens in conjunction with phase two. So in phase three, basically the liver releases this water-soluble state, and that's the one we've all been waiting for, it releases it out via your skin, so it releases out via your sweat glands. It releases it out via your urine, so it's coming out via our kidneys. And it also releases it out via our colon. So the three phase of the liver detox, understanding that, remember the the proverb, knowledge is easy to him that understands. When you understand the three phase of the liver detox, you begin to understand how you should fast and what you should do when you're fasting. You can see why we give three green barleys on Monday because on Monday, phase one is happening. And on Monday, the, the greatest need is for antioxidants. And so the juices... The green barley supplement well supplies that. But on day two, which is Tuesday, our liver has now gone into phase two of the liver detox and the greatest need in phase two is amino acids because amino acids effectively mops up all these nasty little metabolites. And so on Tuesday, we give three, three protein drinks because the liver's requirement for amino acid is greater, but just two green barleys, because the need for antioxidants is not as great on Tuesday. Yes? Are you using the pole also when you make the juice? Definitely no pole. Why not? Isn't fiber important? Absolutely. But we're wanting a fast. So if you have the pole, you're not fasting. <laughs> If you have the pulp, you're digesting. Mm. You see, when you don't have any fibre at all going into the body, your body's fasting because those juices take about 10 minutes to digest. That's it. And it takes 1,200 calories to digest a meal. And when you're not digesting, the body starts looking for things to do. It's like when you're on holidays at home. I don't know about you, but I go to areas that have been bugging me, but, you know, they're not a priority. It's like the bookcase, starting to look like that. People are putting books in all upside down all over the place. It's bugging me, but it's not a priority. I've got to wash the dishes, I've got to wash the clothes, I've got to cook the meals, I've got to make the veggies, you know, all of those are your day-to-day. But on holidays, wow, last holidays, I pulled all those books out of that bookcase and I got them all back into order. Nice feeling. That's exactly what your body does when you're not digesting food. When you're not digesting food, all the energy that goes to digestion now looks away, looks around for something to do. And it'll, it'll do different things in different bodies, depending where your greatest need are. And that's why fasting has been done for centuries. For centuries, it's been done to overcome illness. But the problem today is that we are exposed to more environmental poisons than any generation that ever lived on the planet. It is estimated that we are exposed to 100,000 new chemicals every year. Yes. And who would have ever thought it was in our clothes? 
That's a surprise to most people. See, when I was a little girl in the late 50s, 60s, all my clothes were just cotton. Except if it got cold, then I had a woolly jumper. Our milk came in glass bottles. Our cereal was in greaseproof paper. I went to school with sandwiches wrapped in greaseproof paper and a paper bag. Plastic was, was hardly at all. And but plastic's another area, it's an environmental poison. So we are exposed to so much and it slipped up upon us without us even realising it. So I was in a, it was in 2022, I was uh, in a European country and they lost my bags. They lost my bags for two days and I was being filmed so I had to, I had to have nice clothes on. So I, I went to a few ladies about my size and said, can I borrow some clothes for a couple of days? Do you know, most of the clothes I couldn't wear because they were made out of these chemical, these chemical fabrics. Remember, they were created in a chemical laboratory. There's your polyesters and your nylons and your acrylics. So these are areas where environmental poisons are coming in. That's why we say to our guests, please be mindful of what you're wearing. It's unfortunate because it's not till they come. <laughs> And, they, and some ladies that want to do the steam sauna, they say, oh, I don't want to wear this nylon costume. So we give them a, a sarong. You know what the Fijians wear? They just wrap a, it's like either cotton or rayon. So these environmental poisons are coming in in so many ways. Yes? How often do I recommend doing this? It depends. We say in Australia, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> it depends on you. Now, the man that was the Vietnam veteran, we gave him a protein drink every single juice Monday and Tuesday. Can you see why? You see, when, when you go on the fast, we're not giving you enough glucose to run on, so some of your fat stores are getting broken down to give the glucose that you need to run on. But as that fat store gets broken down to give you the glucose, the environmental poisons are released. And that explains why on a detox, a person's breath can be worse than usual, their body odour can be worse than usual, their, what they're leaving in the bathroom can have a, a much worse smell. I say, rejoice, where was it before it came out of you? <laughs> It's because uh, that's what happens in a detox. But what we've got today is we're, in, we're all got environmental poisons in us. And that's why understanding the three phases of the liver detox is so important. And it explains why water fasts, they're out. Sorry, they're out. Because if you just do a water fast, and your environmental poisons are released, can you see you've got nothing to mop up those free radicals? And, and if you go into the second stage of liver detox and you're not supplying amino acids, guess what? The, the body sees the crisis, so the liver starts to break down. The liver starts to break down in an attempt to supply some amino acids to try and mop up these toxic metabolites. <laughs> now, my attention was first brought to this. It was probably about 15 years ago. So about 15 years ago, we had um, uh, a young guy who's named Anton, and he was about 44. He had a few issues. He had had some exposure to environmental poisons. He had some allergy issues. And on the second day, and we didn't used to do this. I didn't know about the three phase of the liver detox 15 years ago. And so on the Monday, he seemed to go okay. But on Tuesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the staff said, Anton needs to speak to you. I said, what's the matter, Anton? He said, I just feel terrible. He said, I've got terrible diarrhea. I feel like vomiting. He said, it's as if my body says to me, I need protein. I said, I'm hearing you. Have you ever been to a doctor who won't listen to you? It's very frustrating. Don't be that doctor. If the body speaks, act. 
<laughs> and if you don't listen to the first whisper, the body will start screaming. And when it starts screaming, it's doing damage. Listen. And this man listened. And I listened. And I made him a protein drink. I gave it to him. I saw him half an hour later. He said, thank you. That feels so much better. Now, how did he know he needed protein? I don't know. It was just an inner voice in his body saying protein will help. But it brought me back to the drawing board. Why did Anton need protein? And it was probably 14 years ago when I did my uh, nutrition course. I studied nutrition. We had 10 modules. Every module we studied the three phases of the liver detox. And I thought, aha. And as soon as I realized what the liver does on the three phases of the liver detox, I began to implement protein. And every second juice, we, we serve a protein drink. So with uh, the guy that was the Vietnam vet, his name was Ben, we gave him protein every single juice and another one at seven o'clock at night. Because what was coming out of him was pretty toxic and it needed to be mopped up and it needed amino acids to mop it up. How many people take a protein drink when they're fasting? Not many. Not many. Now, this three phase of the liver detox, it's only been known since I think it's about 2010. So many people are unaware of the three phase of the liver detox. There's an Australian author named Dr. Sandra Cabot, and she's written a book called The Ultimate Detox. And she spends a whole chapter on the three phase of the liver detox. When my book arrives, hopefully today or tomorrow, I have a whole chapter on the liver and I explain the three phase of the liver detox. And after hearing this lecture today, when you read it, you will understand it. Maybe if you read it yesterday, you wouldn't have quite got it. But it's a very, it's very important information for us human beings living on planet Earth in 2023 because of what we are exposed to. You are far better to do two days once a week than a 10-day fast. Because on a 10-day fast, you can start releasing too much fat-soluble toxins and cause too many free radicals to be released. We actually are never sure how people are going to go when we look on the fast. So we listen and we watch and we adapt and adjust person to person. That's why you're the doctor. I believe God designed each one of us to be our own doctors because only we know what we've been through. Only we know how different things respond or react on us. And listening is very, very important. So I listened to Anton. I took note as I studied this, and we now implement the protein drink every juice. And we have found that with this juicing program that we use, most people cruise through. Probably the people that have the most struggle are the people coming off coffee. So if someone says to me, do you drink coffee? I'll say, no, I just watch the people suffer. Misty Mountain Health Retreat, and I choose not to. I'll walk past a coffee shop. I'll inhale deeply because it's such a lovely scent, but I'll just keep walking. <laughs> because I know what it does, and I want to get my energy from the place that God designed us to get energy from, and that is the food that I eat, and having a, a good night's sleep, and recharging and reviving there, and then exercising through the day to increase those uh, oxygen going to the cell, because how much more energy am I going to get? 18 times more energy if I've got adequate oxygen going into my body. I want to explore that. In, in more detail in another lecture. Do you suggest doing it to children? Do I suggest doing it to children? Well, <laughs> if they're open. <laughs> and we had a three-year-old girl attend our program and, and she did it, but uh, not, not every child is open to this. So some agree, but we have found by having the juice every two hours and having the, the supplements that most people don't really feel much hunger. And if, yeah? 
How many ounces are they very good? Eight. There's your eight ounce. Oh, one ounce. Eight ounce. I think the green barley is about one ounce and protein mix is about two ounces. It's a bit hard for me because I'm adjusting from um, mils to ounces, but I I think that's about right. So we do the 250 mil, that's an eight ounce, and uh, I think we do 100 mil of those little ones. So I'm just in my mind, and I'm not... Um, I'm not great on maths, but it's something like that. Thirty-five, two grams. It was two ounces. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's about a quarter of that, maybe a quarter or a half. And if it was a six-foot, eighteen-year-old man, maybe he'd he'd like four ounces. So we adjust. We adjust, and we get some people saying too much, too much. And so, if it's too much, well, we bring it back. If they say it's not enough, we'll bring it forth. So there's there's certainly an adjusting. Yeah, maybe it's four ounces again. Forgive me, I'm Australian. I'm not using ounces. We're adding that to the carrot. No, we're not. No, no, no we're not. They, these come with it. These come with it. So. Maybe that's two and maybe that's four, but you know what? You'll work it out. <laughs> so just to Am clarify, right? you get eight ounces of okay. the carrot, apple, you celery. Get eight ounces of juice, and with that, you get... There we go. Depending yes. on where it is. Yeah. So Something you're adding, like adding to the eight ounces. So it's no, it's you are not. You are not. It's You'll get two... So at 8 o'clock, you'll get your juice, and then you'll get a little cup, and yeah. it's your green barley. Yeah. And then the next juice, you'll get your juice, and then you'll get a little glass that has your protein in it. So we don't add it to it. No. Gotcha. Then the, then the glass would overflow. <laughs> Are there any specifications on protein powder when you're selecting that? Uh, there are specifications on protein powder. Um, you go for a plant protein, and um, I guess you just look at the ingredients. Now, someone said, well, what pea protein do you use in Australia? I have to tell you, I don't know. I don't have anything to do with the ordering. I just, you know, you just you just do, do the best you can. You just look at your ingredients. Yeah? My husband and I are actually doing your book right now. We've been doing the detoxes as well. I looked at the one that you have at Pixie Mountain. Nutrient Biotic has one that matches it pretty closely. Okay, thank you for that. Apparently Nutribiotic has a protein uh supplement that's similar to that but i know you can get some pretty good ones i know there's some quite nice hemp ones you can get yeah as in those two days exercise oh yes oh yes our guests are woken up at six o'clock every morning and they're given a warm lemon water and then at seven thirty uh six thirty to seven thirty we do exercise and some say, well, how can you get the energy? Well, they're your glycogen stores. Your glycogen stores, remember, they're quick-release glucose stores already sitting in your muscle cell. The worst time to exercise is after you've eaten because your body is putting a lot of energy into digestion. And the best time to exercise is early in the morning. Our guests also do a core strengthening workout at 1 o'clock every day, so there's a whole program then. That our, that our guests do on the two days of the detox, yes? Is a toxic liver what they're calling a fatty liver these days? A toxic liver is not actually a fatty liver, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because I'll show you what a, a fatty liver is. And they're finding non-alcoholic fatty liver now because alcoholics commonly get a fatty liver, so let me show you what a fatty liver is. So you'll notice that I said that I showed you how all carbohydrates break down to glucose, because glucose is a singular molecular structure. But there's another singular molecular structure called fructose. And especially if, so that apple that I ate for breakfast this morning, it broke down in my body to fructose and glucose. So now fructose and glucose get carried to the liver because the liver is the only organ in the body with fructose receptor sites. No other organ has fructose receptor sites. So that, that apple broke down to fructose and glucose. 
The fructose and glucose both go to the liver. The liver converts the fructose to glucose and then it gets sent to the cell to go through the energy cycles. That's how it works. But I wouldn't be surprised if someone this morning, I'm sure not here, but I'm sure someone this morning had juice and in that juice there's a lot of fructose and glucose and maybe there's sugar in the juice and sugar breaks down to fructose and glucose. So there's an excess of fructose. And then, um, and then maybe they had a cup of coffee with sugar in it. There's more fructose and, and glucose. And then they had a, um, a croissant and it was sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. And here's more fructose. And then maybe they had a slice of white bread that's been sweetened with high fructose corn syrup which is the cheapest and the nastiest form of sweetening. And then on top of that, they put jam, or you call it jelly, and that had fruit, and that had sugar in. Can you see more fructose and glucose? So let, let me finish. Can you see what's happening here? What have we got overload of? Sugar. Fructose. Fructose mm. overload. Now, I didn't get fructose overload in my apple. But can you see how the scales are tipped, especially with sugar? And you combine that with breads and pastries, all sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. Because high fructose corn syrup is high in fructose. <laughs> you see that? So what's happening now is you've got fructose overload. And so the fructose, which is actually far more than even the glucose, comes to the liver the liver cannot convert that overload of fructose to glucose, so what does it do with it? Stores it as fat. And it can only store it on the liver because the liver is the only organ with fructose receptor site. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So really it's this high fructose corn syrup and how many, how many pastries are sweetened with that today? Mm -hmm. And people have a look at it and they say, hi, oh, yeah, high fructose. Oh, fruit. Uh, corn. Oh, yeah, corn's good. Uh, so can you see the wording that people think this can't be that bad? But it's actually a very dangerous form of sweetening and it's one of the biggest contributing factors to fatty liver. Nothing wrong with the apple I had this morning. Nothing wrong with a, a bunch of grapes. Can you see the biggest problem? is the high fructose corn syrup and the sugar. And you get a combination of those two, you get too much fructose. And then it, the, the liver's got no choice, it has to store its fat. So how do we get rid of a fatty liver? Oh, it's real easy. Get the refined sugar out of the diet, get the high anything with high fructose corn syrup out of the diet, even, even go very low fruit for a week and exercise every day and you probably find that that will resolve in a couple of weeks. It's very easy fixed actually. So the hand at the back I can take now. Okay. Uh, one of the questions was how often can we take the liver detox a year? How, liver, how often, again, I said, how long's a piece of string? If I did this every week, if I turned sideways, you wouldn't see me because <laughs> I just lose so much weight. So you have to do it depending on you. Now, if I was 300 pound instead of 100 pound, it certainly would not hurt for me to do this every week. That, that's a great way of getting that, that weight down quite quickly. If someone had... Now, we find if someone's been a hairdresser, if someone has um, had high exposure to chemicals, often farmers have, uh, painters. A friend of mine is a close friend from when I was younger. He's, he's my age now and he has Parkinson's disease. He's a Tyler. All of that exposure to those chemicals has little by little eaten away at his mile and sheep and very, very sad he's got Parkinson's. So depending on the chemical load in the body, depending on the chemical exposure in the body in the past as to how much is released when the person is detoxing. And again, depending on the weight, when someone's very light, I'm cautious as to, as to how much you would fast them. So 
You're the doctor there. I'll leave it up to you. Some people do it once a month. Some people do it once a week. It it depends on what you want and basically, uh, yeah, what, what you want to achieve. Yeah. Would this be safe for somebody with autoimmune disease such as hepatitis C they claim is coming from? Would the this be would well I, I have to tell you I don't believe in autoimmune diseases. I think it's just a name that's put on put on things because the body was not designed to eat itself. Some things come in, whether it's a heavy metal or whether it's a toxic chemical, that has caused the body to switch into this. So rather than Naming it, I like to look at, well, where did this come from? And if someone's got an autoimmune disease, fasting would not hurt them at all because, as you can see, you're, you're nutritionally supporting the liver to effectively detox. And if someone's got an autoimmune disease, it's, you're, you're pretty sure that they've got some chemical load in their body and this can little by little eat away at it. The body is an amazing piece of machinery. You see, if all the chemicals or the environmental poisons were to come out of us right now, it'd kill us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the body lets go of it little by little by little. So you don't want to push that process too hard by going on long water fasts. Mm. Because if you do that today, you can often get quite sick. And what and what, what are you told if you get sick? Oh, it's all right, you're going through a healing crisis. The healing crisis, it's a liver crisis. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to lose part of your project manager. The liver's a very important organ and we need to look after it. And you look after it by nutritionally supporting so it can, be a, it can effectively detoxify you from environmental poisons. I even noticed with my babies, I'm up in a rainforest, I noticed that from about age one their breath wasn't as nice <laughs> as when they were when they were little tiny babies. Because the fact is, well, they're they're even born today with a few things happening in their body. But I thank God that because of this this liver detox, we can effectively detoxify us from environmental poisons. But it's not enough to sweep the house. You've got to sweep up the pile of dust. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Not enough to sweep the house. Not enough to go through the three phase of the liver detox. We need to ensure that our organs of elimination are eliminating effectively to be able to take that waste away. So the largest organ of elimination is your skin and we don't often think of the skin like that and your skin does quite a few things your skin breathes so be very careful um, what you put on your skin and so when people are going through the detox we're very mindful to advise people as to what they're putting on their skin what can interfere with the skin breathing if it, uh, environmental poisons are going on the skin in the form of uh, moisturizers, uh, antiperspirants? Be very careful. You might need a magnifying glass to, to, know, what's, to know what's in these things. <laughs> Have you noticed the small print, print got, that you can't read has got the most important stuff? I saw a lady in the supermarket one day. She had a wire around her neck and the biggest magnifying glass I've ever seen. It was about as big as a bread and butter plate. <laughs> and some say, wouldn't it take you forever to shop? Only the first shop. Because after that first shop, you know where to go and what to get. So allow the skin to breathe. We're, we're cautious to advise our guests on what they're putting on their skin. Your skin needs water because it uses water to throw off the waste. So we need water in and we need water out. So we advise our guests that while they're on the detox, and it's also important every single day of our lives to have eight plus glasses of water a day. So eight, eight ounce glasses. And you start early. Because the best day, the best way is to have it little by little by little. Just the way God sends the rain. How does he send it? Little by little by little. 
But if there's an avalanche of water coming, that's when floods happen and topsoil's washed away. So please don't drink 16 ounces all at once. You're putting an avalanche into the body. And if you drink 16 ounces all at once, it's not long before 16 ounces are going to have to come out. Is that right? I travel a lot. You know what I do? I just drink little by little by little because I don't want to be have to getting up time to go to the bathroom. Your body can access the water. Obviously, water goes in, water must come out. But you can balance that a little bit by taking it little by little by little. Copper pipes where the steam billows out and the people go in there for about 15 minutes and then go and dive in the mountain stream back in the steam sauna. They usually do that three times. My, my, my daughter's got one that she uh, had built in her yard. It's a, a little uh, sauna and they throw the water on the rocks which makes the steam. And it's a change room, she's in Wisconsin, and she's got this tub, it's like a horse's trough, so it'd be about, I don't know, a metre and a half, uh, a yard and a half long, <laughs> yard wide, and maybe a yard and a half high. And she said, watch this. So she sent me a little video clip, and there comes my tiny little four-year-old granddaughter out <laughs> with her white curls and jumps into that. She climbs up. You can hear her going like this. <laughs> and she gets straight out. And, and Emma says, was that good? She said, yes. Mm -hmm. And she runs back into the steam sauna. So if a four-year-old girl can do it, guess what? <laughs> we all can. And you are so hot from the steam that the cool is actually refreshing. And she said to me, her limit was 22 seconds staying in the cold. Mm -hmm. A little tough one, that one. <laughs> so we always encourage people to do the steam sauna when they're juicing because if you give your body the right conditions, that means you're well hydrated and you go into the steam sauna, up to 70% of body's waste can be eliminated via the skin. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? That's why a steam sauna, I think, is an important part of a, a detox program. Because, hey, that's the easiest way to get the waste out, isn't it? <laughs> the, the, other, the other areas are a little bit more complicated. And you can't hydrate your body half an hour before the steam. So you've got to start in the morning. So all through the day you take that water so that our guests by the end of the day, they're nicely hydrated to the steam. The skin also needs us to exercise because when you exercise you increase the circulation of the blood to the skin and when you exercise and the circulation of the blood is increased to the skin it increases the body's ability to throw off waste via the skin. Another organ of elimination are the lungs and the lungs must have fresh air. So at our retreat, there's lots of fresh air, but we do ask our guests, please open the windows. I notice in the hotel I'm staying, you cannot open the windows. But most of the time, I sleep with my windows open. And the way to ensure you're getting fresh air is to breathe through your nose. Mouth is for talking, mouth is for singing, mouth is for whistling, mouth is for eating and drinking. Nose is for breathing. Nose and nose alone must take the air in and out. Nose purifies the air. Nose humidifies the air. Nose pressurizes the air. Nose balances the blood gases inside the body. And nose moisturizes the air. Mouth does not do any of that. And so when people have become mouth breathers, they can encourage their body to become nose breathers by taping up their mouth. <laughs> Not like that, but just a little bit of tape from underneath the nose to the chin. That can encourage, uh, that can encourage nose breathing. In fact, we would see a disappearance of snoring and sleep apnea if people would start nose breathing. 
you don't know what you're doing at night. So what I say to people, tape up your mouth for an hour a day for a week and then tape it up and go to sleep. <laughs> One lady said, I did it with my husband and he didn't snore the whole night. Because when you snore, where do, where's the noise coming from? <clears throat> <It's>, uh, <laughs> the mouth breathing. Yeah. So not only do our lungs need fresh air, they must, must, and fresh air is only ensured as you breathe through the nose. The lungs also need you to exercise because when you exercise, you increase the circulation of the blood to the lungs. And when you exercise, your breathing changes. And that's when we have to do the, the long, slow, deep. I call it God's LSD, long, slow, deep, abdominal breathing. So nose abdominal breathing is essential to get the pure air. And the hardest time to nose breathe is when you're exercising. But you can. You'll feel like you can't, but you'll get better at it. If you find that you can't do it, yes, you can get a little bit through your mouth now and then, but you can train yourself to only nose breathe when you're exercising. Your lungs also need water because when you're well hydrated, there's a little bit of moisture in every single alveoli, which is what our lungs are full of, is the alveoli. That's where the gaseous exchange takes place. The next organ of elimination is your kidneys, and your kidneys filter your blood. And your kidneys, for them to be an effective organ of elimination, they must be getting exercise every day. Exercise increases blood supply to the kidneys. Exercise also massages gently the kidneys. When you're walking, the kidneys are moving. Or if you're rebounding, kidneys are moving, or if you're doing Pilates type exercises, core strengthening exercises, your, your kidneys are moving, yeah? Just, what, what does someone do when they're struggling with just a constant sinus issue and allergies and they just have trouble breathing all the time? So if, if a person's constantly challenged with sinus issues, we're going to be looking at respiratory later in the week. And when we look at respiratory, we'll be, we'll be looking at why that is, that is so. So kidneys also need for us to be drinking adequate water. So I put it up there, okay, water. Do you remember the, the email I said, well, there was a text I got from a friend of mine in Dubai that said she had an E. coli in her urine, what should she do? Take antibiotics, I said no need for antibiotics. Quite pot. See, if you hadn't drunk water all day and then you um, went to and had a blood uh, urine test, it wouldn't look very good. Then the next day you drink heaps of water and then go and have a urine test, guess what? It'll be totally different. It'll be totally different. So drinking water, our urine should be almost the colour of water. If it's not the colour of water, what's it telling you? What do you... That's... This is what you do as being your own doctor. You've got to listen to your body. You've got to look at the colour of your urine. In fact, have a look at other things that come out of your body. It'll, te it'll tell you something. So water and water alone. One lady said, I drink a lot of water in my cups of tea. Sorry, no. <laughs> How clean would your body be if you washed it in a cup of tea? <laughs> no, it must be water. You'll get used to it. <laughs> Your kidneys also need you to be warm, you to keep them warm. Now, even though I know here in Dallas, you've just had many days of very, very hot weather. The problem is when you come into these cold air conditioned rooms, that's when the kidneys can chill. And your kidneys are situated between your waist and your ribs. So it's in that back that back area, very important to make sure that's covered and that's kept warm. When your kidneys get cold, the blood, the blood can't be taken in there because whenever we're warm, it's because of the blood. So if, if you've got cold hands and look at them, you'll find that they're, they're not very red because the blood is what brings the warmth. 
Only microscopic waste can come out of your kidneys, your lungs, and your skin. The largest pieces of waste comes out via your colon. And when our guests are on the, the detox program, we give them a herb tea at night. And this herb tea helps the colon to continue to move. Because notice that our guests don't have any fibre given to them for two and a half days. Now we want to bypass digestion, and I showed you why that is so, so that the fat cells start to break down and the body effectively begins to detoxify us. But we don't want the colon to stop. And so we give a herb tea, and this herb tea is a combination of a few, a few herbs. So I'll, I'll just write down the herb tea that we give our guests. And is this, this during the detox? Pardon? Is this during the detox? That's right. Now, if someone comes to our retreat, and they usually evacuate four times a day, they don't, need, they don't usually need this tea. And so we sort of make a guess at about how much each person needs. And some people need half a cup, some need, people need one cup. We had a lady recently, and she needed three cups a day. She usually goes once a week. Oh my goodness. Dr. Kellogg said three intakes of food a day should equal, what's the common sense to that? Three evacuations a day. And we're going to be spending a whole morning on the gastrointestinal tract soon. So what's the tea? It's one part, Cascara Sagrada. Now, if a person were to take a whole cup of Cascara Sagrada, it is so bitter, it is almost inedible, and it can cause really quite strong cramping. So we've got a nice mix that we found works well. It's two part licorice, and licorice is a fairly sweet herb, and three part buckthorn. Buckthorn is a relative of cascara, but it's not quite as bitter, and it's not quite as strong. So these two are barks and that one is a root. And whenever you've got barks and roots, they need a gentle simmer. So you buy these and put them in that proportion into a jar. And then the recipe, so the recipe to make it is uh, one teaspoon, and this is rule of thumb to most herbs. So it's one teaspoon to one cup of water. So one teaspoon of the herb to one cup of water, and because it's a root and their roots and their barks, they need a probably about a 10 minute simmer. Not boiled furiously, please, just a 10 minute simmer. So the 10 minute simmer allows for the actives in the herbs to be able to be taken out going into the water. And if someone usually goes once a day, we usually give them one cup of that tea at night. And then in the morning, they will go like they usually go. If someone usually goes once every two days, they might need a cup in the, in the evening and a cup maybe in the middle of the day. We usually say to our guests, if you have not evacuated by the middle of the day Monday, please have another cup of tea. So... Again, how long is a piece of string as to how much tea? Everyone's different. But it's important that the colon continually or continue ev to evacuate while you're on a detox. Because remember, only microscopic waste can come out of the skin, the lungs and the kidneys. The colon evacuates the largest pieces of waste. So what does the colon need? The colon needs for us to be well hydrated. The colon needs for us to be exercising every day. And the colon also needs the right position. What's the right position? It's quite exciting. So the right position is, is squatting. <laughs> 
So what, what the research now shows is that squatting is the best position to go because it relaxes a muscle inside the colon which opens the colon and it takes all the pressure off the anus. So if someone feels that they need a little, to, if someone feels they need to encourage the colon to move and they strain, that puts all the pressure on the colon on the anus, which can actually weaken it and even cause hemorrhoids. So it's important not to strain. It's important to have the right position though. And you can buy a, buy a, a stool called Squatty Potty, which can just wrap around the toilet so that that position can be taken. And a lot of people have found that it's made a big difference in their daily evacuations and their ability to go by, by being in the, uh, the, the squatting position. So to ensure that the colon goes every day, keep it well hydrated. Um, it also needs to be swept every day. So it needs fiber, but of course we are not giving fiber to our guests for two days. And so because we're not giving them fiber for two days, we offer herbs. So we had a lady attend our program. She was a psychologist and she goes, she used to go once a week with help. She said, once a week I take a mix and it just cleans it out. And I, when she came to our retreat, I said, we'll get you moving. <laughs> and so she needed three cups of that tea a day. Not many people need that. In fact, if I had three cups a day, I'd probably just be sitting on the toilet. Anyway. <laughs> so again, you're the doctor there. You, you, you will get to know how much you need. And three cups a day got her going once or twice a day. We also applied castor oil compresses to her abdomen and that penetrates deep and can help with the situation. By the end of the week, she was feeling so good. Her skin had a different color. Her whites of her eyes were white. In fact, she said, I can't believe how good I feel and I can't believe how clear my mind is. She said, maybe this is the problem with most of my patients. <laughs> Did you hear what she was? A psychologist. <laughs> and so she, uh, she went home and she told me this six months later. She said, I went home and I, I did total lifestyle changes. I started exercising, I started eating plant foods, I started having more fiber, I stopped the coffee, I stopped the wine. She's, so she implemented everything she learned at the retreat. And she said she took three cups of the tea a day, one in the morning, one in the middle of the day, and one in the evening, and that got her evacuating twice a day. She said six weeks later, she started going four times a day. So she brought it back to two cups a day. Got that? <laughs> What's she doing? Listening. She's listening to her body. She said after six weeks, she started going four times a day, so she went back to one cup a day. After six weeks, what's happening? Four times a day. She said, it took me four months, but she said, I'm off all the tea and I'm evacuating regularly. What I love about the herbs, remember Psalm 104 verse 14, God gave herbs for the service of man. They'll come in and they'll serve you. So what these herbs effectively did, they revived and restored colon function. Because mm. I've, I've had some people say, but I'm drinking all my water, I'm eating a plant-based diet, I'm exercising, but I'm still not going. And that's where the herbs can come in and they can revive and restore colon function. But I love what this lady did. She listened. She listened. See, no man could tell her what to do. She took guidance from her body. Yes? Cheers. So I've seen like when, when my wife, she'll eat a lot of like, veg, be more vegetarian. Yeah. Slowly she backs up, you know, and yeah. I'm not sure what kind of fiber. What? Well, you, you'd have to have a look. If someone's eating more fiber and they slow down, you'd have to look at what they usually ate and then compare that to what they are eating and also what type of fiber. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of things that come into the equation. So you adapt and adjust, and you, there's trial and error there to see, to is see what. Is there a type of fiber that, you should, that, that is ideal? Is there a type of fiber that's ideal? Well, your plant fiber is your very best fiber, 
but there's a great fiber and a very easy way to get movement if some people love the taste of this tea and some people hate it so <laughs> it has a bitter aftertaste and a bit of a sweet overtone one lady loved it and this other man hated it he reckoned it tasted like sun oil so they're having an argument <laughs> He said, this is terrible. And she said, no, it's not as nice. <laughs> that was their argument. One man said it tastes like, tastes like cold Coca-Cola. <laughs> Another man said, must be a long time since you've drunk it. <laughs> so, you know, again, you're, you're listening to your body. And, and here's a nice little mix that you can pour all over your, um, your breakfast every morning. It's a third of a cup, third of a cup of chia seed to one quart of water and when you put that together you're going to have to do the shake for about five minutes shake 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 it shake it shake it shake it if i'm doing it i'll put it down and i'll cut up some fruit then i'll go back shake 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 and you can keep that in your fridge but you pour that it's like a it's like a uh, soft gel you pour that all over fruit salad. You have a half a cup of that a day, that'll certainly encourage uh, movement. So there's a few things you can do to encourage movement. There's one more tiny little organ of elimination. And this little organ of elimination is called the tongue. So when our guests wake up in the morning, when they're on the detox program, the tongue doesn't taste very nice because waste can come out of the tongue. And there's a simple thing that you can do to encourage waste coming out of the tongue, and that's oil pulling. So what's oil pulling? Oil pulling is putting a teaspoon of coconut oil in your mouth and swishing. You might swish for 10 seconds, you might um, rest for 10 seconds, you might swish for 10 seconds and rest for 10 seconds and you do that over about 10 minutes. It's called oil pulling because this coconut oil, coconut oil effectively pulls waste out of your tongue, it pulls waste out of the glands under your tongue, it pulls waste out of the blood vessels under your tongue because it's going to be full of <laughs> toxins, environmental poisons. And don't release it down the plug hole. I think you call it the sinkhole, yeah? Because the coconut oil, what happens when it goes, when it gets cold? Hardness. It goes hard. And you're going to plug up your plumbing. So release it out on the grass. You'll give something for the microorganisms in the soil to eat. And take some water with you and rinse your mouth a couple of times and release that out. It appears that oil pulling not only pulls waste out of your tongue, uh, under, you know, the glands under your tongue, the blood vessels under your tongue, it also seems to, to, to release um, the, the lungs. Because when people have bronchitis and they oil pull, often they'll cough up a couple of lumps. And if people have sinus problems and they'll oil pull, often after the oil pulling, they'll blow their nose a few times. So it seems to release in a few areas. Now there's some wonderful little, two little, uh, probably lobes in your throat called the tonsils. You've heard of the tonsils? The tonsils are the only part of the lymphatic system that throws waste straight out. And your lymphatic system is a network of capillaries all through your body that sweeps away waste from the tissues. So usually, as the lymphatic system sweeps away waste from the tissues, it dumps it into the lymph nodes, in your neck, in your groin, under your arms, and then it dumps the waste into the blood, and then the, and then the organs of elimination throw the waste out. But the wonderful thing about the tonsils is that that waste is thrown straight into the tonsils and you cough it up. So if you oil pull and there's a little bit of a something what you cough up, it's possibly come out of your tonsils. Praise God, what an incredible organ is the tonsils. So if the tonsils keep swelling, do you know what that tells you? Something's wrong in the body. So let's look at the old days when they had a big 
big uh, wall around the castle and they had a watchman on the castle and the watchman sees an army coming and it starts blowing the trumpet and yelling and the people say, oh, how can I sleep with that watchman? So they shoot the watchman. Now, has that fixed everything? <laughs> that's what happens when you take the tonsils out. You've just shot the watchman because that's what your tonsils are. They're the watchman at the gate. So rather than chop them out, Let's ask the question, why are they swollen? They're swollen because something's going into the body that the body's reacting to. So please, uh, value your tonsils, look after your tonsils. And if they're, if they're inflamed, it's usually for good reason. So there are the simple organs of elimination and the things that you can do to encourage your body to throw up waste. We live in a self-healing, self-cleansing organism. And if you give the body the right conditions, you know, every day it will clean. Every day, little by little, it will cleanse, it will throw off the waste. And every now and then you might visit a retreat where you do a two-day detox to encourage that to do it even more powerfully, or you might choose to do it at home. But I thank God that we live in a self-help cleansing, self-healing organism. So I thank you for your attention. I think we're afternoon now. We are afternoon. And we're going to come back tomorrow. And I can't off the top of my head tell you what tomorrow's subjects are. Gut health, digestion, colon. Oh no, tomorrow's the gut. Is it? Digestion, gut health, and colon. Great. Well, tomorrow, students, we're going to go on a journey through your gastrointestinal tract. <laughs> it's, okay. it's 10 yards long, so it'll take us a bit of a while. But you will find it very interesting to see exactly what happens in different stages through our gastrointestinal tract. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Yeah.